All right, uh, my name is Jim Martinez. I work at the University of Florida in Gainesville, about um, 100, 120 miles north of here. Uh, I work at a housing data center. We have data on housing. Uh, part of the thing, uh, part of my job is putting it up on the web. We have housing experts who decide what data the housing people want to see. And we put it up, and, and we've uh, had our website up for, I don't know, maybe eight years now. And, and we have a test suite, and I've been testing uh, the applications, testing the, the test suite using Mechanize. Mechanize is a scriptable, it's sort of a scriptable, scriptable browser that, uh, that uses Perl. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. I'm uh, proud to be here, and I'm also humble to be here. I'm proud because of, of the things we've done. I'm humble because I've never done things like write an HTTP server at the last guy did. I've never, raise your hand if you've ever written an HTTP server. Okay. I've never written an object-oriented system, you know, like people here have. Has anyone written an object-oriented system? I've never done that. So, um, so I'm both proud and humble to be here. Uh, my basic philosophy, I think there's more than one way to do things. I think I'm, I'm sort of a grace at heart, so I think if, I, I don't really think there's, you know, there, depending on situations, there's a lot of different um, possible solutions. And I see lots of room for improvement in my code. So I'm both proud and humble to be talking. Uh, so the different types of tests, there's unit level testing, there's uh, component level testing, there's system level testing. Uh, does anyone want to take a guess at, uh, or not guess, but tell me what they think test mechanized does? Does test mechanized do the system level? Uh, so unit level is sort of like a, a method. You might test a method with it. Component level is sort of um, bigger than unit, and system level is bigger than that. I think it's a system level. That's what I use it for testing. System level tests for all of the, the, the things that we do. So I test the smaller things in other tests. I don't use mechanize to test uh, unit level. I don't use mechanize to test components. I use mechanize to test the system um, as a whole. I have other tests that test to test those uh, component and unit level tests. So at the Schubert Center, we have about 45 applications um, running in a framework that I built uh, on Perl. Um, they all have the sort of same uh, page structure. There's a G page where you get to see the uh, geography. There's a, a page where you pick the indicators if someone's interested about renters or owners. And then after that, they see the results page, which shows one or more tables. So all of these applications are very similar. Um, these similarities make me think it'd be easy to test um, because they're they're similar. Uh, in the back end, they're different, but the back end I don't test using mechanized. The back end I test using like test more, and I, I don't have the web in the way, so the back end is sort of the business logic. Um, so there's different reporting engines. Um, I don't test that using uh, mechanized. And the URLs are even similar. I even sort of have the same handler. They're all slash a something. Um, we have the same. Uh, we have a, a controller that runs everything. We don't use Catalyst. Maybe we should run Catalyst, but we don't. It, it's sort of a homegrown framework. Um, so on the applications that we have built up, we built them one at a time. And when you build these applications one at a time, you sort of go into natural problems. There's like natural pitfalls that you went to. And I went into them. So let's look at um, how would you test one app. So uh, here's some, some, I guess it's not pseudocode, it, maybe it's real code. Uh, code to test a single app application. So in the first line, use test shim. I subclass mechanize, subclassing mechanize, um, uh, actually subclass test ww mechanize. So if you don't know how to subclass, you can actually just look at test ww mechanize. That's how I learned. I look at, looked at it. It says use base. It says uh, it builds a tester. The first like five lines I stole just from 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 uh, test ww mechanize. Um, so that's what's in the first line. Um, the, we, we make an instance of the Schimberg test mechanize object and uh, it has a method that says go to the G page and test it. All you have to feed it is, is the URL to go to and it goes to that URL. And we have a lot of tests in there on what to test. I, I have a slide on like what that does, what are the details of what it tests. Uh, and after it tests that uh, first page, it goes to the second page. Um, uh, it, it, it picks a county, the geography, and it goes to the second page, and then it runs tests there, and then it goes to the final page, the results page, which I call the R page, and it, it tests there. So this is sort of a, a high-level approach uh, to, to testing. You feed it the parameters.
Um, so you notice I don't I don't test all the options. Uh, maybe you can't tell just by looking at the slide, but I don't test all the options. So there's a lot of options to pick. There's a lot of counties to pick. There's 450 cities to pick. We don't pick each one because it's not a component level test. It's a system level test. Yeah, um, uh, this level of testing is designed to find errors that would happen sort of independent of whatever you pick. Although sometimes we do get errors for individual counties, St. John's and St. Lucie, people misspell them. There's a lot of errors like that. So actually the code does sort of take special exceptions. Because St. John's, St. Lucie, those always cause problems. Miami-Dade, because they renamed themselves like 15 years ago and there's still problems with Miami-Dade because it used to be Dade. So it used to be the, the top of the list and that's Miami-Dade. So except for, for, for the most part, if we're testing system level and if you found an, an, an error in one county, it would be in the same county. Um, so that's why. We test only one, or, or just a handful. Um, now we want to use the same code to test two. So we have that same code up there. How do we alter it to test two? Does anyone have any ideas? Change the word. <laughs> yeah. So so the, the well this so this is. This is for a particular app, this is for a particular app, this is for a particular app. So we just put that, that, and that in some data structure, and we loop over all of these three. That's what I did. It's, it's, it sort of leads you down the wrong way, but that's what I did. So we just had the loop. Uh, I didn't show the app config. The app config has that stuff, and you, you feed it in. So now we're ready to go. Um, But some apps don't have that indicator page. The, the, the basic format sort of changes slightly. And this small change, um, the way this happened historically was that we didn't, we didn't have it that way. We first made an app that had the geo page, the indicator page, and the results page. We made another app that did it. We made, made like five of them. Then all of a sudden, the boss says, how about we don't, have, don't give them any options? They just pick, it was a profile. They pick Orlando, and we give them the profile for Orlando. They don't pick anything else. So now I have to come in here and change the code. Um, well, we're going to do it with an if statement. Anyone want to suggest where the if statement would go, since there's no i page, or what you have to do? <coughs> put it around the go to i page and touch. Right. And you just put a you just put a you just put the if around it. That's that's very natural. <coughs> right. So um, that's what I did. I put it around the i page, and and uh, the app's good. At this point, we had maybe 20 apps going. Uh, but there are more variations. Not only do some have that middle indicator page, um, oops. Uh, sometimes uh, the boss came back and said, well, how about we don't let them pick different counties? How about they just, they just pick one county? Okay, so I'll make the I page instead of checkbox for Orlando will be a link. So you hit the link. So now we have, some of them have links, some of them don't have links. Um, same thing with the indicators. Let's only make them pick one indicator. They can't pick owners and renters on the i page. I'm interested in owners. I'm interested in renters. You can only pick one. So I made that links now. Um, there were more variations that needed more conditionals in this loop. So the loop starts getting a bunch of conditionals on, on what's going to happen. And the test code became complex. After a couple of years, the test code was really complex. This loop was huge. The configure was huge. It was like 45 apps. So when you start looking at the test, it's enormous to figure out what, what's going on. You know, you could have a typo in, in, your, in your big hash, all kinds of things can happen in your big hash. Then we had the big loop with lots of conditionals. So um, the, the, the tests were hard to code. Um, when, we added, when we added something, I wasn't sure if the reason that a failure happened was because of something in this long loop that, that started happening. So putting the tests in made it, um, it was uh, like, it was painful to do the tests. Um, so I needed to refactor my test suite, but how do you refactor a test suite? What's the problem with refactoring a test suite? You need a test for a test suite. <laughs> <laughs> need a test for the test suite. Right, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, so you have to make tests for the test suite, but you, what's the problem with that? You're probably going to have to test your test suite. How do you test your test suite? Well, goes on and on. So that's not really the solution. Well, it's, so um, there's another way, uh, and this is what I started doing. You alter the test system, the system under the test, to make sure that the tests, you, you need the test to fail. So I changed my production code to see my tests 
fail, so I know that my test was working right, and then I changed the production code back. So this is the way I, I did it for a while. Okay, I needed to make sure that the test is breaking. That's kind of, that's not, that's, I don't know, maybe making a test suite is better than this, but that's what I did. What's the problem with, uh, with changing your production code to see your test fail and then changing your production code back? How do you know you changed it back right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you know you, you, you changed it back right? Also, we have a test suite that runs all of these automatically and sends me, um, we had like, at, at one point we had five developers, now we only have a couple, there's this great economy. We had a lot of uh, programmers, um, and so it would check everyone, and so we would get an email, it was, it was an automated checkout, it would email everyone, and you can't have an auto-admitted way to screw up your production code to see if your test is good and then put it back in, so you can't automate this, that's another <laughs> problem. So, um, uh, so test code should be simple. Um, production code is complex, and, and you, you know, you're solving a complex problem, but testing, usually you can think of a way to make the test code simple. Um, so the test code, in, in, in comparison to the like production, whatever your problem you're trying to solve, usually your problems are kind of hard, and, and the reason you do whatever an object that does whatever you have, uh, you can't get away from that. But in test code, you can. I, I went to a conference and uh, I saw uh, this guy, Gerard Mez, uh, Mezaro's talk, and he gave this exact situation. He just gave a code smell. Your code, your library is. Your, your code, how do you refactor? And I went to it and he said this exact thing and I was like saying, amen, this is exactly what's happening to us, this is exactly what we're doing. Um, we can't, we can't, ref we, we can't um, maintain this code. So um, he, um, <clears throat> he, he gave his condition, make the test code simple. It, it shouldn't have, any, he, he, he was pretty strict, he said you shouldn't have any loops, you shouldn't have any conditionals in your test code. And that's kind of hard to do, but it actually helped with my case. Um, uh, basically, you need one possible execution path in the test code, and that's pretty po that's that's doable. You can have one possible execution in the test code. I had that problem. I have the big loop in all of the ifs. If you blow an if or if you blow a regex, it starts testing the wrong thing, and it's really hard to debug in that big uh, that big. You don't have you don't know where you are. There's lots of exe lots of execution paths in the code. So instead of um, testing in this loop. Um, we have a test file for each app. So instead of having 45 configs, I made 45 different files. At first that was like painful. Oh no, 45 files. But it was a really good trade-off because it made the test suite maintainable. It, did, it, it does actually have duplicate code when you, when, you put them, when you break it out of a loop into 45 different files. But it's such a tremendous trade-off. And it's really not that bad. But you know, I'm sort of ingrained to no duplication, no duplication. And, and getting out of the loop is sort of, well, now it's not elegant anymore. It's not elegant, but I said, I'm going to live. I'm going to be able to write the code. I'm going to be able to continue with the code. So um, so this is, so I made tables like this. I put the config in the .te file. I put uh, the mechanized new. And uh, I, I refactored the test suite so that it didn't have the conditionals. It used um, dispatching instead of ifs. But there still are ifs in there. It was hard for me to get all the ifs out. I couldn't, I couldn't get all the ifs out. Um, but uh, this made, took care of a lot of the problems. Now if it fails, only one of the 45 fails. And if it's not me, you know what application is having the problem. So it reduces lots of things. Uh, it's a very good trade-off. Sounds an awful lot like a unit test. <laughs> so we use dispatch tables um, instead of conditionals. And unrolling the, loop, unrolling the loop creates duplication, but that's okay. It's a big trade-off to, to be able to, to live. So, uh, how much time do I have left? Time is that I can't see this. I can't see my calendar. We have how much time do I have left? Okay. Sorry. It's twelve twenty now. It's twelve twenty now, and I have till twelve twenty, right? Thirty. Oh, till twelve thirty. Twelve twenty. We started a little late. Twelve thirty is. Twelve thirty is left. Yeah, twelve thirty. So we start. Okay. So ten minutes. Yeah, ten. Okay. So hey, what? What's a test? Here's some of the things I, I've test. Is the HTML <coughs> well formed? In other words, if you have a starting tag, does it have an ending tag? That bites us a lot. Uh, a, a typo in the template will not do that. We'll, we'll we'll get the tags mismatched. So is the HTML well formed? Better than being well formed is it valid HTML? Actually, we can't do that because we have too many pages that are not valid, it comes from data outside, there's a lot of reasons, so I tried to use um, the validator service, the W3 has a, 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 a 
you could put their software on your server and have the W3 validator on your server. I did that. It wasn't that hard. It's like sysadmin work. And then you, you start it up, and this plugs right into it. So I did that, but it told me we have like 400 pages that are bad, and I just couldn't do it. So that's a, that's a good thing to have. I, I wish we could have validation, though. Know? And most of the errors are small, like images need to have an alt tag. Images need to have a, a height tag. Images need to have... So there's a bunch of small things. We, don't, we're, we have all the HTML on our sites as well for them, but <laughs> it's not valid for these, these very small... For, for these, it's, it's just not valid sometimes. Uh, is the status code 200? That's good to check. Uh, this has bit me sometimes because sometimes the program says status code is 200 and the program continues and hits an error and then dies. But what the, the code it sends to the client is 200. So sometimes, some, sometimes if, you, if you write a, a program, make sure that uh, you're, you don't send 200 until you know it's 200, which really means you're done with everything. That's kind of hard to do. So I, not only I check, uh, do I check if it's 200, but... Um, oh. But I put if it if one of my templates fails, sometimes there's a typo in the template. We use template toolkit to build stuff. Sometimes there's a uh, there's a typo in the uh, in the template, and the template toolkit dies. But the 200 gets sent out, the header gets sent out, the navigation from the page gets sent out, and then when it hits the template, it dies, and then it, and then it sends out um, it actually then sends out a 500 error that the browser doesn't know what to do with, and sends the error out. So um, what I did is uh, I, if the template crashes. Um, and, and it doesn't die. I put an HTML tag that says uh, an HTML comment that says error in there. So my HTML templating system sort of tells the the system what's happening if there's any problems by using HTML uh, comments. So the the script checks that. We'll, we'll see that in the I have a slide for that. Um, and also, I, I, I is navigation present? That's the same type of error. Every every uh, every page has to be on a certain tab. We have a tab navigation. If you very often we blow it, we instead of the home page we type home page or something, so that's not there. You look on the web page and then no tab is highlighted, so that's an error. So the nav, so the templating system will put that in error. Error, you didn't give me a nav tab. I don't know what navigation is supposed to be open, so nothing's going to be there. So the, so our tests with the system will catch it. Same thing with breadcrumb. We're supposed to have a breadcrumb on every page. If there's an error, the templating system puts a little HTML comment about an error um, for the breadcrumb. Is authentication working? You can test. Well, some of our pages need authentication. We test that. This actually failed. Some. This is saved me. It's failed and said, "Authentication mm -hmm. failed." I go to it. There's no authentication on 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 these pages. What happened? I, I blew the HD password file. Uh, is the text is the title not empty? You shouldn't have a title for an HTML page not empty. Are there any printable characters? We get a lot of our data from data sets, and the data that the people give us sometimes they they have unprintable characters. I don't know because it comes from Excel or something. Um, yeah, so this is all pages should have breadcrumb. Uh, the breadcrumb's not classed, the template can die. Uh, this is what I just said. The report has an HTML comment. So this is this is what I do. The Met Met has this uh, contact contact context like context like and this searches for the breadcrumb marker. So breadcrumb markers put there by the template when everything's okay. If everything's not okay, it prints out error. And I have another test that says um, content unlike HTML comment error. <laughs> oh, and so here's a very helpful technique. Um, if you're going to do something where the application doesn't change, you can use this fingerprint um, technique. So the fingerprint technique is before you do the changes, you gather all the URLs that you, that you know of that are good, um, and uh, I have a little script that goes and pulls that pulls that code down, pulls that page down, and takes. It used to take an MD5 of it. Now I just actually store the page because I can store the page as big. So you, it, it fingerprints it by taking an MD5 hash of it, so it knows what it looks like. And then after I've taken all of those pages, I, I take a snapshot of them uh, in a good state. Then I go back and do my changes, and I can run the test. And the the, the, the test basically says pull this page again, and does it look like what the fingerprint is? If they're the same, good. So this is a test when you don't expect anything to change. When do you not expect anything to change? When you're upgrading. So like when I moved from Apache, uh, we used to use Mod Pro 1 to Mod Pro 2. The translation was really hard, but this helped a bunch because it told me when I, got, when I got things right. I went to our log for our production site. I got about 500 URLs from the log. I went to our sandbox, pulled all those 500 pages down, snapshotted them, got the MD5 sums. 
upgrade the system to Mod Pro 2 and then reran the first, first it, was, it didn't even really run, it didn't run because there was, there was a big change from Mod Pro 1 to Mod Pro 2. So I had to do a lot of things just to get it running. And once it was running, then I ran the snapshot where it took all the 400 pages and it knew what it was supposed to look like and it checked to see if it was good. So this helps with upgrades, it helps with upgrading um, any types of upgrades. Uh, before, I, before I started doing this, it was hard to upgrade, you wouldn't know what was going on. And in fact, we caught errors on our production uh, box. Things changed. We didn't have the ordering and the SQL exactly right. But PostgreSQL, if you don't have the ordering and the SQL right, PostgreSQL orders it the same way every time until it's restarted. But we didn't, PostgreSQL was up for like, I don't know, a year or something. We didn't have to stop it. It was, it was good. And so this actually found a difference. That's why I stopped taking the MD5 sum, because the MD5 sum just said, something's different. I'm like, well, what's the different? I didn't catch the HTML. I don't have the old page. All I have is the MD5 sum of the old page. Why is it different? So it took me a long time to figure out that we didn't have sufficient ordering. Uh, so here's, here's um, here, I, I mentioned here's some books. The Refactoring Test Code by Mizaros. That's really good. It talks about what to do when you're when your test code is bad, and, it, and more importantly, it has ideas on how you can make your test code simple, like the dispatch method. method. Um, uh, another good book is Working, Working Effectively with Legacy Code by Michael Feathers. So a lot of our applications weren't, um, were, were done before we, we had our system in place, and now we have to support them. How are you going to support legacy applications? He has a really good book on, uh, on, on how to do it using test driven development. And uh, refactoring is just a basic book, not on, not on testing, but just on how to refactor using a test suite. So these three books are really good. The, the simplest one is at the bottom, the second one is sort of the middle one, and the top one is when your test suite has been in production for a long time. I think that's it. Yeah. Any questions? Finished two minutes early, that's like a 10% increase, a decrease. Thanks.